could be the outline, the shape of the guitar, and the other final form. But if you know the history briefly, I know it was just Sue's over, your two chairs, the yellow community. Um, product configurations came later, design patents, in the 1790s. I don't know if you mean I wasn't practicing, in the 1790s. We had design patents. Design patents indicated the source of a plate or a floor pattern on something. We're talking, yes, we're talking a long time ago. And that was sort of the way we depicted a source, keyword, the source of the product. That floral design on a pattern on a piece of china indicated somebody made that somewhere, either in Boston or they made it somewhere place in the country. And a lot of people use design patents and applied to them in the early days of our country to establish product sourcing. I could look at that and I know that it came from Paul Revere. Um, we didn't take this sort of trademark aspect of things seriously in the 1830s, 1840s. And then we began to use trademarks as indicating, ah, I make this beer, I make this thing, and I want people to know it's from me because I think I make something of high quality, therefore they should know the source they're getting it from. So it kind of started to become a bit of a consumer issue, it's not kind of a, a manufacturing issue all at once. And as time went on, people realized trademark has value. And it took a lot of industries a long time. And it took our industry much longer. We are not always cutting edge on things. It is an industry of passion, industry of tubes, wood, strings. Our crowd of it, yes. But we don't always get progressive. And so the idea of trademark and product configuration really came much later. We had some uh, design patents filed for in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, a couple of the major guitar companies filed design patents. I'm familiar with design patents. They last for 14 years. That's all. And after the 14 years, you're done. If you have not filed for trademark simultaneously and carried it forward, then you can't go backwards and say, I had a patent on that. Your time for any level of enforcement of that is over. So, design patents had a problem. Short duration. Design patents had another problem. And that was that if you had any utility function, you had an act, your cutaway of the car was purely functional. Someone could say, that has pure utility value, and I can defeat your design patent. Now, nobody wants to be arguing the other side, somebody saying, I can just do this with my hand because you have the utility value for something. So design patents didn't always come in the favor, but people did not focus on trademarks. Where trademarks started to become more an issue was in the 70s. In the 70s, developed a couple of companies decided we need, with the changing in manufacturing from various sources, let's start saying now first it was Europe, and then it became European manufacturing. The price point probably be the same, so people weren't saying I'm concerned about that company making something like mine because of all the VAT issues and all the other issues going on in the industry. I don't have a problem with that. It's when it shifted to Japan and Korea that people started to look upon trademarks of the pet stock as something very important for guitars. And that's where we went. So that was to prevent, at the time, perceived notion, perceived notion that they were competing with a lesser product that was less expensive. Of course, we all now know that some of the Japanese manufacturers were making superior products, but that's just such kids talking. So when that occurred, people started to move into the area of trademark for headstock configuration. Because we kind of all look at headstocks as being the place we look for who manufactures something. We get into the 80s, and as Mary had said, uh, I was general counsel for one of the major companies here. And we went, we ran into a problem with another major company over our applications for three headstocks. And our three headstocks were pretty neat. I thought they were ours, but we had an independent the marketplace, and people recognized them as ours. So when they opposed our applications to these marks, I said to uh, I said, we think we have the right. We need to establish our ownership of these because people recognize.
universities and college. Uh, and that's one of the key factors in all of this product iteration. So we fought that out, we won, and won on appeal. And now that company has those same stocks continues to be used down for 31 years. And that sort of began a little bit of the end of the system. Uh, and it's been going on over 30, 30 years now. We've been sort of developing this sort of issue about bodies, head stocks, bodies, head stocks, bodies, head stocks. So we went through a period where in the 90s, well, we had some wars, if you will, in the late 80s, early 90s. But then the 90s became the time that people really woke up because they realized, I want to own as much as I can. And of course, there's always the issue whether you can own something. That's the concept of genericism. You may have had the start with something, and this is where I'm going to get into the wisdom sessions. So I get a couple of calls today, emails today, about these things. In the last few, I'm sure one of them in my phone right now, that they'll ask things about, hey, if, here's a great example, somebody will say, I know X company makes this head stock. I was told, or I read on the way, this is a personal favorite, or I was told by Alan Friedman that who's a CPA, which should not be the person discussing it, that if I make my head stop or my body shape 20% different from that company X, I'm on the hook, right? I'll take anybody's answer to that. Anybody believe that? Besides Alan Friedman, anybody believe that? Interesting. Jen believes it, but it's not true. I kind of have somebody say it. Let's go with it. I'll even give you a French comic bag for going this. It depends. This is not about adult items. Alright? Alright, so you too. You too. The point is that almost everybody you went out of that show. Right now, have you asked anybody at those booths randomly? I am guaranteeing you you're going to get an 80% ratio of people who say, that's absolutely true, of course, I read about it. And I read about it on the blogs. I read about it on any one of the guitar blogs. I'm just talking guitars to no one. I, and this goes this on all whole day for me personally and my friends. This goes on a whole day. Where did that come from? The same place that all the other stuff comes from. That's not Somebody's on the thread wrote it on a blog one day, and somebody said, hey, that guy was he's talking about his feelings at the time. So let's start there. That's not how anything works. That's not a product configuration law. And we have a couple of attorneys right here, very well practiced IP attorneys, I can tell you. That they're probably saying, I can do that. Of course. Come here to do that. But everybody does believe that. And they also believe other things. There's the percentage ratio. There's the three-dimensional aspect. If I make mine a little bit, if I concave something in the back, in the back, in the back, am I okay? Does anybody see the concave in the back? Can you recognize a guitar from a concave aspect of the back of a guitar as a consumer? Can you see that? I'll take any answer. No. So it's a practical thing. Do you think that I can spot that and say, yeah? Well, that's not product configuration stuff we should talk about. That may be a patent, that may be a design patent, but it probably has utility value. So that's probably a utility patent. You know, patent attorneys here, you can call it not good. But the point is, is that that's believed by almost every other industry, because our industry has been a little slow to come around to the knowledge base, except when things were how it's just common urban myths became a people's ideas. Let me get you another one. Anybody here ever write or see anything about what they call lawsuit guitars? Any guitar players have read that? You can raise your hand so I can know you actually have guests back here. Everybody's read that at some point. Lawsuit guitars, lawsuit guitars. I own a lawsuit guitar. There was a lawsuit guitar. Number one, there probably wasn't a lawsuit. Number one. Number two, it probably wasn't about what you're thinking it was about. It was probably about somebody decided to call their brand and let's say it was McGillicuddy. There's this uh, McGillicuddy. And it had the same letter, and it looked pretty similar. It had a similar headstock. Keyword, headstock. Product configuration. But 
had probably nothing to do with the lot shape because no neighboring eye can own the trademark in the body shape. So the issue lost the guitar because that's just somebody who's a collector trying to get a better dollar on eBay. We all know. That is not how it is. That case wasn't about that. And that's one of the massive mythologies in our business is that these things are because somebody said they are. So I was very happy to, to have an answer to this discussion today. I said, let me start there because it's what I hear all day long. And then it's Shape, common shapes, 
um, themes don't make for strong product configuration trademarks. They're too similar to other people in the marketplace. We now know origin is not important. We also know that thickness of the body shape is not important. Let's talk about other instruments. Anybody here a keyboard player? Any? Thank goodness you showed up. The keyboard playing issue is clear. We have a ubiquitous nature of keyboards. One, because of the format. Yes, we can see some guys stay around once I know. But the general issue for a keyboard is it's difficult to make it look good. So we may adapt to something else that's not product configuration oriented. We may go for color. Because we have a color as a trademark. Anybody here own a Jaguar? I don't. Anybody here own a Jaguar? Jaguar Green is a trademark. Ferrari Red. I know Ferrari. I know but Tiffany. And then you have Celeste for Beyond you know, Device, their color. So you have colors. So some people look that with that, but that's different. That's not product configuration. But I get asked by people who say I have a keyboard product, look at the shape of my keyboard, I'd like to apply for a trademark. Mine's different. And I would say this is many times a year. Yours is uh, just like any other electric keyboard. It goes, mine's different. Look, my edges are round. Okay, so do you think that anybody really recognizes your round ends versus anybody else's round ends? Because Voyager and all those other companies have made rounded end keyboards. And usually I'm able to have a civil conversation sometimes with people to suggest maybe that's not the best way to spend your money. The other part of product configuration is there has to be somebody who recognizes that as yours and solely as yours. So if we apply for a trademark and we say, Hey, I am exclusive in my usage of this. I better be telling the truth. Am I exclusive using this? Is my double cutaway guitar exclusive in the marketplace when I'm applying? Probably not. Because of, I have to be very different in my two dimensional outline, my 1950s mentality, my two dimensional outline, to really have people notice my different from theirs. And that's tough. That's very tough with product configurations. And product configurations, and we have probably litigated most of them in the industry, are very, very time consuming. And my point to everybody always is, let's not try to go there. Let's try to look at something we can create that is different, something that is our own, something we can protect, something which creates our own identity. And I always try to stress that in an industry filled with really brilliant people, try to make your own identity out of this. But instead, I get a lot of those calls, I'd like to make my 20% difference. Here's the other one, mine's smaller. Now what you're thinking, on, yeah, not mine, this is guitar stuff. Mine's smaller. So is mine different? This is a trademark. Trademark is not about size, because look what we just applied for, it's on a piece of paper, it's this big. So is that the size of your guitar? No, that's the shape we're talking about as a product configuration. So again, the 20% size difference, how would that ever, how would that ever conceptually work? What if I'm making a guitar that's this big and someone else has a trademark as a product configuration, but mine's something in a box and I sell it in a toy store? Is that a possible infringement? Sure, that could possibly be. It doesn't matter, it's smaller. So with the size, sorry? Personally, I'd rather write the letter, get the guy on the phone, talk to his attorney, get it taken care of, but that's not always how our industry works. We have some very contentious people in our industry, and they would prefer to do other things. I, and that's how I have two kids in college to grad school. Thank you so much. So this is, this is really sort of the background and a little bit of the history of our product configurations. And I wanted to kind of make sure that everybody was clear on the basics because a lot of the lawyers speak can be daunting. I would know because I play one on TV and I'm surrounded by that. And it's best to know the practical real world stuff. And so I'm trying to give you the practical real world experience. By the way, anytime you have a question, please, Mr. No. But so I'm going to go on to the next issue, and that is 
do I actually have something I can apply for that literally is something that I can suggest is mine? Something is unique to me. And by the way, go back to guitars. Is it possible? Absolutely it's possible. But we all know we have basic platforms. We get to a guitar that doesn't balance correctly, or if you want to make a zine shape, but if it doesn't balance correctly, we may not be in a commercially viable aspect of selling it. But we want to make sure something's different. So we go back, by the time we're done, by the time we've cleaned it all up, by the time we've done the sand, by the time we've done all that work, it looks just like that or that. We're very close to that or that. We already know that 20% is nonsense. So what's the next issue? The next issue is maybe we can't own that. That comes as a dark moment in our conversation. We may not be able to own that. Yes, Al? Yes. Okay. I suspect that was something that could have been trademarked because it was something recognizable by someone else. Is that the only thing that you the, the German The German manufacturer is totally very. Al's question was did he buy a dance guitar on eBay? That's what he asked. But, excellent question. So what he really said was our now long lamented uh, Prince. Um, he was talking about Prince's guitars, that they were very unique. But you also notice Prince also in his career played one guitar that looked like exactly like another guitar that's made by a major manufacturer, which is part, which is part of another major case, which I have to know a little about this. I guess did that, but you can see how difficult it gets. Look how far off that had to go, right? The guitar up the valve extends out incredibly long. It stops different. Is it possible for that guitar to possibly be recognized as what you're talking about? Prince, it's got to be the manufacturer. So the manufacturer has to be the secondary meaning kind of Prince. You can't say, oh, Prince plays that, but Prince didn't make it. He's not the source. It's going to have to be the XYZ company. So those are two very different things. But if the XYZ company were to apply for that and make more of those, it's possible, yeah. I think that that's a shame that they have a shot. Yes. Excellent question. Yes. Would you like to remind you right now, sir? The Prince guitar, did he sell more than one of them? I believe there were more than one. Yes. He was very particular about guitars, as we all know. Uh, he watched the last two guitars, and lots of people made guitars. Um, the question was, is there more than one? If there's only one, we have a problem because we're in commerce with one guitar. We have to be in commerce all the time. We sell one guitar, we're not in commerce. We have a one of them. Hope that answers that question. So if you make a couple every year, by the way, there's no fixed number that you're required to make. But as long as you're in commerce making that, and you, by the way, file all your renewals for the trademark, you'll be okay. But it's an excellent question because lots of people make wacky one-off guitars and say, look at that though. But that's one. Excellent question. Any other questions about those particular one-offs? Those are also excellent questions. So, I'll move on to them. Did you answer my question? I think I did. Okay. Number 7555, it was made in Nagoya, Japan. I don't have the specific test on the guitar gen, but I'll talk about There's a headstock issue, yes. Right, can you talk about the headstock? Yes, okay. So, if you were listening about the Japanese manufacturing, which scared a lot of American manufacturers, because the perception was they would be able to flood the United States with product. Not necessarily true. What was really underlying was a lot of it was really well-made stuff. If those of you are a little older, say I'm the only one, okay, I'll volunteer, I'll speak to the older people here. Um, the mid-1980s were not the height of quality for American guitar manufacturing. Am I surprising anybody? Am I shocking anybody? Anybody about to get up with a sharp object? Hopefully not. No? We're all agree. Okay, thank goodness. It was not the height. What happens when we're not making really great stuff here is that other people enter the marketplace. The Japanese manufacturers were entering the marketplace to bring the product to the United States. For whatever purpose, whatever reason, I'm not going to suggest, but sometimes the head stocks may look like other major manufacturers. Those other major manufacturers are a little frightened. They would say, wait, that looks like mine. So they would then say, okay, there's 
because you're a lawsuit, not about buying shape, not about what's called trade dress, which may be placed for the knob and some of things. This was about literally the head of sign. And rightfully so, probably. That's a word bar. That's another type of trademark. That's a word bar. So if I had Jen on the head stop of the guitar, and someone had Jen with a G, but it had a phonetic, exact phonetic sound alike, I would want them to have that. I want them to stop that because you are spending three quarters of a million dollars a year on your advertising as Jen with a certain type of head stop profile with J-E-N, not bringing in the same similar kind of head stop with G-E-N, then you understand why companies to be upset. And so they have a case. So they so whether, whether they have a case or not is for Judge Judy and not for me.